Dear members and friends, I welcome each of you to the Cliff Dwellers. This club is a warm community of artists and art lovers. Established in 1907, we share ideas, debate issues, and continuously seek ways to strengthen and grow our humanity. Today, we're presenting a special program in celebration of Black History Month. Our fellow club member, Patricia Andrews Keenan, will engage in conversation with award-winning photographer, Peter Angelo Simon. And looming large in this salon talk is the legendary Muhammad Ali. To those of us who grew up in the 60s, Ali was our tireless hero in so many, many fronts. To begin the program, I'm delighted to introduce the innovative Patricia Andrews Keenan. She's the founder of Pigment International, a multimedia arts platform that evangelizes for black art, curation, and innovation. Based in Chicago, the organization creates digital and printed publications that seek to advance the black contemporary aesthetic in the visual arts. Patricia is the publisher of the award-winning Pigment Magazine, and I know there are a few copies out there. And it must be noted, she importantly led the charge for the creation of black art Fine Art Month. It was first celebrated in October 2019. Hurrah. The Pigman International team will be traveling, and I'm so jealous about this, uh, <laughs> to cover the Venice, Venice Biennale this coming April. They will produce a special section of the magazine about the event to which, for the first time ever, a black woman-owned gallery has been invited. Another hurrah. And we'll have to rush to get our copies. <laughs> yes, indeed, we have a lot to celebrate at this event, and it is a wonderful thing for the club and Pigment International to join together in this way. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to the vibrant, creative force that is our own, Patricia Andrews Keenan. Thank you, Eve. Um, thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. And it was because we came here uh, about two before the pandemic. Everything's before a pandemic or after. So we came here before the pandemic to see some work from a very good friend of ours, Deborah Han. And that's where we met Eve, and that's how we ended up being members here. So thank you so much, Eve, for kind of shepherding that. And we also received a grant from the Cliff Dwellers Club before we became members in the first year to help with our magazine. So thank you for that. Uh, so again, I believe everything is relationships, and what we're going to do tonight came about because of a young woman that we met probably in 2017 who was a student at that time at Pratt University, and that was Madison Berger, who's sitting right here, and you're going to hear more from her tonight. Uh, but Madison uh, has since graduated from Pratt and is doing some amazing things that I hope she'll tell us about. But Madison, during her time at Pratt, became associated with Peter because Peter reached out to Pratt about working with him about cataloging his work. And again, I think you take opportunities where they come. And she raised her hand, and she's been working with Peter ever since. And she brought Peter, she introduced him to me, and then I introduced him to Eve. So again, I believe everything comes from relationships. And I appreciate that from you at Madison. We worked together at the Harlem Fine Arts Show, and then uh, we've still been collaborators ever since. So thank you so much. So I am going to open this. Peter is not going to come on until after the film runs. It has about a 17-minute runtime, and I am literally going to read you how it is listed, you know, the opening for that. So it goes. 
In August 1974, photojournalist Peter Angelo Simon was in invited to experience the private world of one of the most famous people on the planet. In a small Pennsylvania hotel of around 4.30 a.m., Peter was woken by a loud knock at his door. Grab your pants and camera. The champ is running. The person in question was Muhammad Ali, who would soon be attempting to regain his world heavyweight title, a title that had been stripped from him as punishment for his refusing the Vietnam draft se seven years earlier. His opponent was to be undefeated George Foreman. The venue, Zaire, Africa. The fight would be dubbed the Rumble in the Jungle. In an intimate stream of consciousness, Peter reveals in words and extraordinary photographs what happened during his unique 48 hours with Muhammad Ali at his private retreat deep in the Pennsylvania countryside, a place dubbed Fighter's Heaven. His shot, he shot 33 rolls of film. What he captured reveals aspects of Ali's fascinating character not previously seen since. Most of the photographs appear on film for the very first time. Peter in his human beings as an art and as an art form in its own right. Few photographers got as close to the boxer behind the legend. So please enjoy the 17 minute film. Last night, I had a dream. When I got to Africa, I had one hell of a rumble. For this fight, I've wrestled with alligators. I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail. When George Fulman meets me, he'll pay his debt. I can drown a drink of water and kill a dead tree. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. I think one of the most powerful things about still photography is the aspect of time. Time never stops, yet still photography always stops and captures a moment in the, in the ceaseless flow of time. It began for me at 4.30 in the morning when I got a knock on the door and his manager said, grab your pants and your camera, the champ is running. The next thing I know, I'm in a car, very slowly moving along this Pennsylvania country road, and up ahead is Muhammad Ali. In the 70s, there was a magazine published in New York. It was called New Times Magazine, and it did pieces on cultural and political trending events. As a freelance photographer, I did a lot of work for them. They had uh, an article that had been written about Ali's preparation, uh, both spiritual and otherwise, for the coming heavyweight championship fight in Zaire, Africa. This is August 1974 about a month before the fight that became known in Ali's phrase as the rumble in the jungle. I didn't know a lot about boxing, but I knew what an extraordinary human being Muhammad Ali was. He had been the heavyweight boxing champion of the world, but it was stripped from him several years before when he had refused to be drafted at the height of the Vietnam War. He was arrested, he was prosecuted. So this fight was his attempt, his chance to regain the title.
George Foreman, his opponent, had never lost a fight. He was brutal. He was known in knocking people out the first round. He had what are called wrecking ball arms and so forth. The world was focused on, on his fate at, the, at this point. Some of his own people were, you know, were really scared about, you know, what would happen to him, that he would be damaged and so forth. In, in the long haul, the magazine, I think, used three pictures. I shot 33 rolls in two days. Ali said nobody had ever taken so many pictures of him before. So there it was before dawn. I got out of the car and raised my camera, and the first picture I took was Muhammad Ali basically running into the rising sun. A little later, I would be in and out of the car, shooting in front and back. And when he finished his five-mile run, he was cooling down. He was punching the air, and I was shooting. And we hadn't said anything, nobody around. And he said, get this. And I raised the camera, and he lifted up his sweatshirt and the rubber liner underneath it, and the sweat poured out. He said, this is called letting out the sweat. And I realized at that moment that Ali really understood that I was not interested in him posing and mugging, but interested in, in his process. What I had fallen into was the idea of being with this man for the next 48 hours and photographing basically everything that he did. We were riding back from this dawn training session and we're at the entrance to his camp. I said, I'd like to take a picture of you here at the entrance. I was waiting for him to put up his dukes and crouch and classic champ shot. But he stood up and he just dropped his arms and he was completely passive. I've never seen a picture before since of, of Ali passive. Muhammad Ali had, had trained for a long time at the Fifth Street, the notorious Fifth Street gym in Miami, and they were challenging uh, conditions, to say the least. The people around him felt he was the champ, he deserved a really good place to train, and so found this piece of land in Deer Lake, Pennsylvania, which was about midway between New York and Washington. Ali felt this would be a sanctuary where he could withdraw from the world and prepare himself for any kind of fight. I didn't really have any preconceived ideas of what I would find. I'd never been to a training camp, but I knew what an extraordinary character Ali was. That's the part that really interested me most. As it turned out, virtually everything I saw was a surprise. A lot of subjects that I photographed have been people involved in creative processes. And it absolutely was the case with Muhammad Ali. There was something new that he was in the process of revealing to the world. I photographed him in his gym, the log cabin gym, jumping rope, training in front of a mirror on the punching bag. Stokely Carmichael, the, the black activist, was there watching him. There was a woman actress and writer who he sat with, and there were tape recorders in the picture where he had played her some of his poetry. He was giving a talk on freedom, I think. He was interested in her ideas.
he went to a local gym and did a performance, an exhibition match. There's a picture I really like a lot of him from behind, and there may be, you know, a couple hundred people in the picture, and virtually everyone is grinning, is clapping, is taking a photograph. It's Ali, it's Muhammad Ali, he's here. I got in the car, I didn't know where we were going, and we pulled up to a nursing home. Ali was welcomed by the head of the home and toured, went through, and it was a ball <laughs> for the people there. And he clearly got as much as he gave in that situation. He loved people, they were very important to him. He came up to one old man, and a nurse who's standing nearby said, do you know who this is? It was kind of hard of hearing. She, he said, yes, Joe Lewis. And <laughs> Ali was, was kind enough and sophisticated enough to, to let it pass and let the, the man enjoy the fact that he had met the great fighter, Joe Lewis. Everywhere he went, he was the eye of the image, the focus. He was like a magnet with iron filings arranging themselves around him. He was away from the spotlight. I felt that he was comfortable in this situation. There's a great connection between magic and, and the visual arts. I mean, magic is a visual phenomenon. I discovered it one amazing weekend when I was, oh, seven or eight. A wonderful aunt I had, she took me to a magic show. And then she took me that night to the back room of a restaurant where the magicians who had performed were all meeting. And the next day, she bought me some tricks. I got right into it. What appealed to me was the idea of creating something that would astonish people. I would do a trick, and people would be amazed. The appeal of photography is essentially the same thing. to create a visual experience for people that, that they find uh, involving and, and perhaps, uh, above all, mysterious. Here I am, uh, not knowing a lot about boxing, finding myself with my magical recording device, the camera, in the presence in the sanctuary of the most famous man on the planet, People with cameras lead peculiar and magical lives. A lot happened in a very short period of time, all part of his imaginative formula for success. He knew what he needed. He had the right people around him in the sanctuary to nourish himself, to prepare himself to feel powerful, you know, be the champ, to feel witty and amusing and loved and <laughs> all of that stuff. He not only succeeded in, in winning by using rope-a-dope in which he laid back for several rounds on the ring and took this fantastic beating. His uh, uh, success in, in triumphing and winning meant a lot, and still to this day means an enormous amount to a lot of people. After this, for several years, he kept boxing, long past when he should have. His own doctor, Ferdy Pacheco, who said Ali was the most physically perfect specimen he'd ever known. I mean, he would heal immediately when he was injured. But as time went on and Ali continued to fight and take beatings, he, he was, his brain was damaged and he suffered.
what he accomplished, I would say, spiritually uh, as well as physically, to be his own man, to be witty, to be sharp, smart, and ultimately, uh, you know, very much a humanitarian. I mean, I think that's certainly what the world needs more of. As soon as that was done and those pictures were turned into the magazine, you know, real life takes over and you're on to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing, and that's that. You, you shoot something and it takes time to become historical. And they're in the present, you know, and then they're a week old, and then they're two years old, and then, you know, a decade has passed since you took them and you, and you look back and they begin to have a value that you didn't realize at the time that they had. And the more time that passes, you begin to <laughs> accept that you've really created something valuable and interesting. It took me a long time to lay claim to these photographs. When I look back on them now, I, <laughs> I'm pretty impressed that uh, I was able to accomplish what I did. That I had captured an extraordinary person at a unique moment in their own uh, history and in the culture, cultural history of the time. So, Madison, I'm going to ask you. So, we segue to Peter. There he is. Hello. Let's give him a round of applause. Yay, Peter. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Dan Glynn, the filmmaker, uh, really made something of, of the experience, and I very much appreciate it. <clears throat> wow. Well, you were amazing, Peter. And so we're going to have a little conversation, but we're going to leave a lot of time for questions. So we're going to do about 15 minutes, and then um, we'll segue to the audience for questions. So my okay, first Pat, question I don't, is, I don't see you yet. Can you not see me? I don't think you will be able to. Oh, OK. OK. Right, Madison? Right, Kristen? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So the first thing I want to know: Where did that mountain lion come from, and what was it doing there? <laughs> uh, it came with a magician, um, and uh, you know, Ollie was very playful, and you could you could see it in some of the pictures, and um, it, it it came with a magician, and it left with a magician. Wow. <laughs> so Peter, you had a very finite amount of time to do this. 48 hours and all of this has come from that. How did you plan out that time in advance? What were your goals knowing you only had 48 hours to be at that camp? What, were, what kind of goals did you set for yourself for that? Oh, there he is. Oh, and there you are. Okay. Um, the only goal I had w was to um, was a sense of discovery. To uh, I'd never been in a fighters camp. I I'd, I'd never met 
Ali, I knew what an extraordinary human being he was. Walt Whitman talked about, uh, he said, I am, I am uh, multitudes. And Ali was certainly multitudes. Um, and what I, my only interest was to keep my eyes open and respond to what I saw. And uh, the, <clears throat> when, when he was cooling down from his uh, five mile run that first time, and he said, get this, and he listed, and I lifted my camera, and he lifted up his sweatshirt and rubber liner under it, and water poured out, and he said, it's called letting out the sweat. And I realized at that moment that um, we made a connection. He, he, he was a people genius, and um, he uh, got that I was really interested in his process, and so, at that point, we had an unspoken agreement that uh, for the time I was there, he would do his thing and I would do my thing. And that's exactly what happened. Well, that's interesting because when I think of Ali, um, he is one of the most, he was one of the most photographed people in the world. Was he, it, was it easy to work with him? I mean, he would kind of guide you through things as well as you discovering things. So how did that go? Because he very much understood the value of photography and what it had to do with his, you know, creating his aura in the world. Yeah, well, he, um, he loved people. He liked being photographed. He realized, uh, as, as D.A. Pennybaker, the filmmaker, mentions in his uh, introduction to, the, to the, my book, um, that he knew that this was, he had a sense of history and uh, he understood that this was a crucial uh, time in his life and in his career. And so he, and he felt comfortable with me. And um, so he just, you know, let it happen. And so I, I consider it really a collaboration. Um, and we, as I said, we, he did his thing and I, uh, you know, clicked away at every, I was amazed at everything I saw there. Yeah. Um, we talked a little bit before in preparation for this about the feel of the camp. So tell us a little bit, because you told me there were people, all kinds of people from all walks of life. Um, you know, it was just a multicultural, just a, a melding of human beings from everywhere. Tell us a little bit and give us a feel for what it was like to be in that camp and the people that were there. It was a very open, very relaxed, uh, welcoming feeling. Uh, he had, um, there were, uh, his, his um, manager, Angelo Dundee, was a white man. His body man and, and some other people were uh, black folks. So it was very, very open. And um, you would ask me, what, what, what else did you ask me just now, Pat? Just the feel. What was the energy the feel, like? There? Right. Um, it. I was very welcomed and very relaxed, and uh, I only asked him to take one picture. Oh, as I explained, with letting out the sweat, he had asked me to take a picture, and later I asked him to take a picture. And other than that, nobody suggested anything that I do something that I not do something. Uh, and the 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 point, the whole idea of the camp in preparation for this uh, coming fight was on the one hand to be for Ali to be relaxed uh, and prepare and a lot of preparation running um, uh, boxing in his ring uh, it's very tedious stuff and so a lot of the things um, and people helped him uh, relax and put out put up with the tediousness that was necessary for him to prepare. Uh, many, many people, not while I was there, but many people came through through that camp. Local people, folks came up in the uh, in one of the log buildings was his gym. And uh, whereas some uh, boxers charged people to come in and watch them uh, spar and, and prepare, uh, Ali's camp was open and anybody who came up there was welcome. And so he, and he liked, uh, <laughs> be, be, being watched by people. And so when he was uh, training in his rim, ring and so forth, uh, there were community, you know, folks from the community would come up there 
and be welcomed. And then many famous um, entertainers and sports people and, and all kinds of people came through that camp while he was there. Not while I was there though. So at the time this happened, I think we said you were a young photographer in your 30s. What impact did that have on your career as a photographer being there for this and having this assignment? Uh, it was extraordinary. I, um, just to this day, uh, the, that experience and these pictures um, are, are one of the most, I think, one of the most interesting things that I've done. I've done many different kinds of photography, special effects and all kinds of assignments and, and fine art things for myself. But the fact that, that um, these uh, captured a time and a spirit um, and uh, Ali would be uh, 80 um, last 17th of last month. Uh, and yet these pictures, um, he's, he's very much alive and his spirit is very much alive. I don't know if that answers your question. It does, it does. Um, oh, also, could you tell us about the boulders? We saw those boulders and they had different names of fighters. What do you know right. about those? Well, at the entrance to the camp was a series of boulders and he had um, had this idea. He had trained when he was uh, Cassius Clay at um, Archie Moore's uh, training camp in San near San Diego called the Salt Mine. And apparently uh, he had some um, some rocks or, or some, some idea that gave Ali, uh, idea for this site-specific, I consider it a site-specific artwork of having boulders with the names of boxing greats uh, painted on them. His father, Cassius Clay Sr. was a sign painter and some of the photographs show him painting, one of them shows him painting the name of Sonny Liston on, one, on the, the uh, boulder at the entrance to the camp. And I saw them as, uh, you know, both inspiring Ali and also um, warning him of the, the challenges and the dangers that he faced. I, I think when I was in south of France, these, I saw these uh, 5,000 year old uh, stone uh, rocks um, going over fields. And I had the same feeling, this sort of mythic feeling that uh, these boulders were personalities. And I think um, Ali saw them that way too. So your, um, your photo piece for the magazine, how did that come out? Um, were you, did you make the cover? Tell us what happened with the first, the first round after you finished the photos and did the magazine piece. Well, I, I turned them in and they used, I think four or five pictures. Um, and then as I say, time passed and uh, at a certain point, I think in, in 2012, I uh, produced a little book myself um, of the photographs. And that, when it came about of doing uh, a photographic book uh, with this English publisher, uh, Tony Norman, Real Arts Press, uh, that was sort of the, um, they sort of followed that concept. We edited it together, but the ideas, a lot of the ideas um, of how to deal with this stuff, I sort of shot it, I, I shoot a lot and it's almost like film and, and um, the book, uh, which is uh, there tonight, uh, kind of was edited like a film. Um, I'm going to ask Madison to come up as well. Madison has been working with Peter to catalog his archive and, uh, oh, sure. So I want her to talk a little bit about the work she's been doing with Peter, how she met him, and then we'll open it up for questions. Hey, everyone. Um, like, like Pat said, my name's Madison, and I've been working with Peter for about six years now. Can you guys hear me okay? <laughs> um, and so I studied photography and fashion design at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Uh, and through studying there, I became sort of introduced to Peter 
and he was looking for a sort of assistant to help with archiving at the time. And um, yeah, so we kind of went from working one day a week to just really sort of having a long sort of relationship of looking at his entire breadth of photography. Uh, Muhammad Ali was definitely the first sort of draw to wanting to work with him and see more of his work. Um, but I think sort of through the throughout the past two years, really, with the whole pandemic, we've been really sort of looking back through uh, all of his work and thinking about where these similarities between subject matters continue to really flourish in his his photography. And one of the, the subjects that Peter photographed uh, sort of before Ali or right after Ali was the creation of the Big Apple Circus in, uh, in New York City. So I start to sort of see a lot of similarities between the way that he photographed Ali, the sort of ability to really capture this creative person uh, in this creative process, and then sort of looking at uh, his other work, like the Big Apple Circus, to really make these sort of comparisons uh, and see also just overall how his photography has really sort of carried these really sort of strong ties to one another of looking at creative people and their sort of uh, moments that they're creating in history and what better to do that with than photography since photographs last forever and they're always alive, like Peter sort of said. I don't know if that answered what you what, said. One of the things I had meant to say, by the way, um, was Ali uh, lived in Chicago for many years, it was his home. When I, when, when uh, the title was stripped from him when he refused the draft, he took refuge in Chicago and lived there and, um, and, and that was his home. So he was, there were many connections, deep connections between the city and, and the champ. And who in the audience knows where he lived in Chicago? Okay, oh, a lot of people. Okay, <laughs> sir, where did he live? In High Park. In High Park, he lived on Woodlawn <laughs> Avenue. So I'd love to open it up. I don't want to, you know, keep, I want to hear the questions. Let Peter hear the questions you might have. Thank you, Madison. So any questions? And then we're also, we're also on uh, YouTube as well. So I'm monitoring here for questions as well. Hi, Veronica. I see you're here. I can't type a response, but <laughs> I can acknowledge that you're here. So who has some questions they'd like to pose to Peter? Savora? I, I can't hear her very well. Okay, we'll repeat it for you. We'll let her do it and then we'll repeat it if we need to. Thank you. Come up, come up and close. This is kind of an intimate setting. Come to the mic. All righty. Um, so Peter, I would, first I wanted to acknowledge you for your extraordinary work, uh, your vision, your courage, and your artistry, and we thank you for that. Um, maybe I was enjoying my brisket <laughs> but I, I may, and may have missed this, but how were you selected uh, for this incredible assignment? <clears throat> I had done many things for the magazine and the picture uh, editor knew that if he sent me out on something, I, he never told me what to do, but he knew I would bring, up, bring back something really interesting. And so, um, I mean, I had I had uh, written documentaries for television uh, uh, before I became a photographer, so I was very comfortable with ideas and concepts and um, producing things. And so, uh, this really was uh, was another assignment. He said, um, "You know, we're going to send you up out to uh, Ali's training camp and you know take some pictures." That's how it came about. So I, I love I love your your. Um... Uh, just how simple you're making this seem, uh, right? Okay, because I, as you talked about Muhammad Ali having a tremendous sense of history about where he stood in time and space, uh, what about you as a photographer photographing the most photographed man and controversial men of his time? Um, how did stepping into that space as a photographer impact you? Well, <coughs> I think I was able to do 
what I did because uh, I, I approached him in a way that I think very few uh, other photographers approached Ali. Um, I was really interested in how, I, I had no idea how he prepared himself, how he spent his time in this uh, period when in a month he would be in Africa uh, trying to regain his title. Uh, so I was interested in everything that I saw. So I, I approached it not with any idea of who Ali was, uh, but with a sense of great uh, ignorance. Uh -huh. Which sometimes <laughs> and, is the and, best place um, to come from, and right? to discover mm -hmm. And to discover with my, my camera what, um, what there was to discover. So I have one final question, um, more about the craft. Uh, there were quite a few images where you used that a wide angle fisheye lens, mm -hmm. which kind of gives a distorted image of your subject matter. Mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. did you make that choice to use that lens? Well, I figured uh, it was a big subject, so I'd take a big wide lens. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and, and it, it, I didn't use it all the time, but it was very useful. Um, the, the pictures in the, of him, the picture of him in the cabin, uh, in the rocker um, was one. Uh, there are quite a number of others where uh, I was quite close in and I was able to get his whole environment uh, in, in one image. So it was, I mean, I used other lenses too, but I'm not a, you know, a lens freak or a technical freak. I, I'm really interested in uh, making, you know, contact with, uh, with the subject and, and being able to um, get it on film. Okay, so I fibbed. I have two last questions. <laughs> uh, one, 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 again, is speaking to the atmosphere in that place. Uh, we saw Stokely Carmichael there, um, one of the leading revolutionary figures, the, the swirl of controversy around Muhammad Ali. Um, was there any sense of the politics of the era um, talked about in that environment? Or was that something that was deliberately left out of conversation because he was focusing on training. Well, I would say, I mean, Ali and, and Stokely Carmichael were, uh, shared a lot of, uh, shared a lot of things. They were both interested in social issues and so forth. And they both admired each other and sort of saw each other as, as heroes in a way. Uh, I wasn't privy to any conversation that they had, but I was very interested in that one photograph of where, um, Ali is on the punching bag, and Stokely Carmichael is is very engaged with with watching him. Uh, that that said a lot to me about about uh, their mutual um, interests and and uh, attraction in a sense. Okay, so I promise my final question: um, <laughs> the most memorable moment of that whole experience for you. If you were to take a memory and put it up on your, in your curio chest, what would that memory be from that moment? Well, you know, and I, I, in a way I could say every time I snapped the shutter, I mean, um, it was, I, I don't have a moment. Uh, it was a, a great experience um, uh, that, that stays with me very much. I don't know if that answers your mm -hmm. question or, if it's last or otherwise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, okay, I'm a, I'm a photographer, maybe you could tell, okay, filmmaker as well. And uh, so the editing process, how did you decide what was in and what was out? That's a good question. And, and uh, as, as you well know, I'm sure, being, being a photographer and, and a filmmaker, um, I said that I made this book online um, and it, it sort of edited itself. I mean, uh, I could, it, uh, they, they give you a format and you can just try things. And so um, I knew that um, what I wanted on the cover and I knew that I wanted to give a sense of um, him, him running, doing his, his um, daily uh, training, training run. And uh, there's a picture where he's running and, and his hands are up um, like, a, like a winner, like a hero. 
and nobody else was around. I mean, I had a feeling, I mean, I was there and he was aware in some, some sense, but I had the feeling that he was, uh, you know, channeling his, his uh, champion self in moments like that. Well, thank you, Peter, uh, for being a champion. As a photographer, I'm sorry, thank you for that. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Dwayne, you, were you coming up for a question? No. Let's see, I don't have any on the screen. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Please. Uh, thank you for being with us. Uh, I'm Michael Sang. Uh, Michael, and, nice to uh, meet you. I think uh, everybody always says stay uh, be spiritual sense in uh, uh, Muhammad Ali. And I was just wondering if any of that came through or uh, kind of a deeper uh, conviction there, uh, a spiritual sense or anything like that that uh, you saw during the time you were there. Uh, that's an interesting question, and uh, there there were some times. I think his openness to people, the pictures um, of him in his sort of uh, visitor cabin with people, but especially when we went to the uh, nursing home, and uh, he really connected with the people there. Uh, and I've heard um, many stories of Ali in many different situations where he was uh, very compassionate and uh, interested, and and you know having a two way, um, it it went two ways. He was somebody who uh, inspired and nourished people, and he was somebody who was very much nourished by people. Um, by the way, I think one of the uh, uh, a man named uh, Jonathan Eig is there tonight. He wrote a a, uh, a biography of Ali, um, and he. Uh, I'm sure uh, could <laughs> could share some stories as well. But um, I knew a doctor who had graduated from uh, Yale, and he was in Miami, <clears throat> and going up in an elevator in a hotel. And the door opened, and he was a big Ali fan. And the door opened, and there was Muhammad Ali. And uh, my this doctor said. What are you doing here? And Ali said, what are you doing here? And folded him into his entourage. And there are many, many, many stories about many people who ran into Ali in an airport or somewhere. And he uh, basically, they, they became friends. Um, somebody said, um, you know, my, my wife is not gonna believe that I met you. And, and Ali said, well, let's call her up. So they went to a phone booth and <laughs> <laughs> he put Ali on the phone. Um, I mean, there are many, many stories like that. Um, Very good. And, and of course, we remember he was, uh, you know, practicing Islam during this time. So I'm sure there was prayer in the morning and in the evening as well. Yes, that was private. I didn't see any of that. Uh, in, in one of his uh, cabins, there was a, and it's in one of the photographs in the book, uh, there's a picture of Elijah Muhammad on the wall. Um, but other than that, it was very uh, private. I wouldn't, if I hadn't known, I wouldn't necessarily know that uh, what his religious preference was or anything about it. Other questions from the audience, Dwayne? And as a matter of fact, Dwayne has some amazing sculptures over here. So if you have not seen them, the, the rust and iron sculptures are his, and please engage with him about those. But go ahead. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so I wonder if there was any period of time where that, that moment of being was around someone and being assigned to this, uh, being assigned to this task of, uh, of, of, of basically f documenting someone that was larger than life. I want to know, did, was there any time where you felt that maybe, maybe, you know, how do I stack up or how do I, you know, why am I here or am I worth <laughs> it or what do I do? Was there any period of time when you're like, oh, how, how am I going to do this? Or was it always just like business as usual and let me get it done? Or how did you get to that point where you were just like, you know what, let me just do the job, you know? 
Well, uh, I, I appreciate uh, the question and um, you're an artist and, and I'm sure you're comfortable with what you do. You see yourself as an artist and you don't, uh, you know, you may say, well, how am I going to do this particular thing? But I'm a photographer. That's what I do. And, and so I'm comfortable with that idea. And um, I, I think uh, pictures that a photographer takes, or, or in your case, a sculpture that you would make, uh, says a lot about who you are. And so while in photography, I'm recording something outside myself, um, it's it certainly um, uh, part of myself. I mean, I see the proscenium uh, of, in the camera of a place where the, 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 the outside world and my inside world meet at the moment that I click the shutter. And that's a fascinating process to me. So I'm, I'm, I'm interested in that and I'm, I'm comfortable with it. I mean, it, it excites me. It's exciting for me to hear that because I think a lot of times when speaking to uh, some artists, you know, they're so um, worried about how their craft will be received that sometimes they just, just don't go out and uh, just do it and be themselves and someone will receive it. So I, I appreciate that. I appreciate uh, how it sounds like you approach the situation and, and it's, it's amazing. So thank you. Um, well, thank you. <laughs> Um, and in the film, you talked about how sometimes you have to let things sit and they have to marinate for a while. And so you came to start the book around 2012. What was that like? You woke up one day and said, hey, now's <laughs> the time to start this. How did you know it was time and how did you, how did you begin the process to uh, pull everything together for the book? Actually, Pat, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> uh, I had, uh, it's something I wanted to do and, and uh, I, I wanted to put them in a format that, that could be shared with other people. Um, and that basically was my motivation. How long, how long did it take? So you started in 12 and I believe the book came out in 16, so four no, years. we're talking about two different books. In 2012, I produced a little online book myself. Okay. Uh, and then uh, in 2016, um, the um, my there's this wonderful um, publisher Tony Norman in London who's uh, has a passion for dis uh, discovering archives of photographs and uh, that have not really um, had had a, a public life and creating a wonderful book about them. That's, you wind them up and that's what Tony does and that's what it did in my case. Uh, the little book that I produced, um, I mean, it didn't, I have some copies, but nothing much ever happened to it. But uh, when Tony saw it, it became part of our creative process of how uh, the book that he produced, um, that there are copies there tonight, uh, how that, um, might, un, you know, inspire it or un, let it unfold. Okay. And if you have not seen the photos, there are photos all around the club for you to take a look at. And then you have another collaboration, a collab as the kids call it nowadays, and you're actually doing something with a clothing maker. Tell the audience a little bit about that. <laughs> There's a company in Amsterdam called Pata, and they produce uh, sports clothing. And so they have um, they have produced uh, four, I think three T-shirts and a hoodie, with some of my photographs of Ali on them. And and Madison, if you would come forth and model for us. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And I think you can go to their website to get any of that merchandise that you're interested in. Um, uh, any questions before? Okay, I'm going to keep going. Um, 
we talked a lot, Peter, uh, you know, Devorah came up and she's a photographer. I've always been a writer. I've always been a photographer. I remember being in college and you could snap your flash at people and they thought you took the picture when you really didn't. So <laughs> for me and, you know, for us in this field and for those members of the club, I mean, photography and writing are how you document history. And I think they are two of the most important things we can do. So t talk to us about that, about, you know, you've had an amazing career. When I first looked you up, I saw you had done work on Martha's Vineyard. You've just been so much. So, you know, just give us a little bit to close us out about the importance of photography in capturing history. Well, that's interesting. The forward to uh, the book was written by D.A. Pennybaker, a wonderful filmmaker. He did uh, Don't Look Back on Bob Dylan uh, and many historical films. And he, he had also filmed uh, when Kennedy was in the White House. Um, and he said, the, you know, he was talking to Kennedy and Kennedy was, you know, he was interested that Kennedy allowed himself to be filmed in, in uh, some pretty serious uh, situations. And Kennedy said he, you know, he, like Ali, had a sense of history. He said it would have been great if somebody had been able to film Roosevelt, for instance, at certain key points. So um, that's just something that's always um, interested me to, to, uh, to document um, uh, people involved in, in creative processes or in moments where uh, something is, um, comes from the inside, uh, and turns into a work of art or, or a creative activity or a circus. Um, that's always, uh, interested me greatly. And I think one of the interesting things about photography and filmmaking is that it, it takes place at the present moment. And then, you know, if it's, well done and, and broad enough that it lives forever. Absolutely, absolutely. And I'm a big fan of Pete Souza's Instagram who captured multiple oh, presidents. Absolutely. Including, including Obama's presidency. So yeah, I have wonderful great, stuff. great respect for that. The, the stuff behind me is some of the uh, things I've worked on over my, over here, uh, I shot, um, was shooting during 9-11, during uh, people responding to the towers coming down. And this one here is a, is a picture I did for, is, I've, I've done a lot of photo illustrations as well as documentary photography. So that was, it's, it's all backwards in this sense, like but it's- that looks like a tornado almost? I'm sorry? Is that the one that looks like a tornado? I was wondering what that was. Well, that's, that was from, uh, I photographed uh, circus acrobats and circus performers with slightly slow exposures to get the movement. And then I worked on Photoshop to sort of take away the realistic co color and create these, um, a series of images that I call Beyond Gravity, which shows, and that's one of them, of a woman who is getting, um, they're like hula hoops uh, from her head to toe. They're, this wow. is the finale of her act and she's getting them Amazing. all all together, all to go at the same time. And, and then this we one have a young behind is, is, is a cover I did for the Sunday Times, New York Times Magazine about uh, left brain and right brain uh, research. So I've done lots of different kinds of stuff and that's the way I like it. Yeah. Well, Peter, thank you for sharing your time for your amazing work and letting us have a little bit of glimpse into history. So thank you for allowing us to be part of that. Well, Pat, thank you for arranging this whole thing. It's, it's been extraordinary and thank you, Madison. Oh, there she goes. There she goes. Uh, <laughs> who's my associate and, and my, my man on the, uh, on the uh, where you are tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. We're sorry you couldn't be here with us, but we we're very glad to have talked to you. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm really sorry I missed the dinner. <laughs> it was good. It was very good. So can we give Peter a hand? No. And Eve, I'll turn it back to you. Oh, wait a minute. Now you have a question. <laughs> Hold on, Peter. Come on up. 
Peter, it's not a... Is this your birthday? Shh. It's his birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a question, but for the... L I wasn't going to use the word pandemic, but I'm going to use it. For the last <laughs> two years, we have been looking at Zoom. And out of the two years of my being involved with looking at Zoom, this has been the only time I've been fulfilled. Thank Aww. you. Thank you. What is, what is your name, sir? <laughs> no. Thank you. Thank you. And Eve, I'm going to give it back to you. Thank you for allowing me to do this, Peter. It's a pleasure. My pleasure, too. This was a great, great evening. And I want to thank Patricia um, for your partnership on this, your ideas. And thank you, Peter. Oh, I do wish you were here. <laughs> but we'll have, to, we'll have to hang out in New York sometime. Or, or Chicago. I, I'd love to be there. Okay. I will at some point. It's a date. It's a date. And you will, you will be coming to the Cliff Dwellers. Um, I want to oh, thank please. our audience. Everybody has just been wonderful here. Wonderful sculpture. Young man, get that confidence up. That's the secret, okay? You're there. And um, thank you, everybody. Love you all. Have a good night, and, and enjoy the rest of Black History Month because we're moving into Women's History Month, and I'm on it. <laughs> Thanks, Eve. Yes, International Women's Day is being celebrated in this club, 12 noon to 2.30 p.m. on March 8th, which is the official International Women's Day. It's celebrated around the world, and we celebrate here. So please join us when you can. We are going to be celebrating women working in arts today. Good night, everybody. Good night.